everybody. Good morning. My name is Amanda Kratza. I am the presenter today for Be Curse Space. Uh, so I am an educator in the New York City area. I specialize in makerspace curriculum, STEM, but essentially project-based learning. Today I'm here with you to talk a little bit about our bumbly friends, the bees. Uh, and I want full disclosure here. I am in no way an apiarist or a bee scientist. I am just a very enthusiastic builder and hobbyist who would like to share with you some resources that I've collected, uh, found over the last couple months, year or so. Uh, so there's gonna be a few exciting different builds. Um, we're gonna touch on IoT and how there's not just hobbyists, but big commercial companies now actually utilizing it to help save our bees. We're also going to talk a little bit about uh, how we can build at home using recyclable materials, building materials, and 3D printing. So I'm going to link shortly uh, my blog, which will have all of these resources in it, as well as all the slides that I'll be using for today. And for right now, you don't really need anything for this class. It's more of a presentation, but if you would like to follow along once we get into the building, um, you can log on to Tinkercad and create a free account. And I will walk you through the process of creating a virtual, um, a digital bee house that can be printed. And it's, it's really quite straightforward and simple. Okay, so let us begin. One moment, just wrestling with my stuff here. You'll also have to bear in mind, so I, like I mentioned, I am a teacher. Um, I'm very much used to having an audience. So if I'm gonna get a little bit rambly or goofy, please don't, don't mind me. I am just getting used to the role of webinars here. All right, everybody, so welcome. Right now I'm sharing my screen and this is gonna be the slides that we're gonna kind of work through. And first I would like to explain to you why I picked this topic. So, there we go. Um, according to a survey from the nonprofit Be Informed Partnership, uh, US beekeepers lost more than 40% of their honeybee colonies between April 2019 and April of 2020. Now this is significantly more than usual. Normally, uh, we were looking at a trend the last few years of about 30% colony loss, which is still quite high. So there has been a little bit of a jump here. Now they actually collect about, we would say 10% of all colonies and uh, from beekeepers in the United States. So we like to think this is a pretty good number to, to round out this data here. Um, losing colonies is a pretty difficult situation, obviously, because no one wants to have to replace their bees, nobody wants to have to go through rebuilding their hives, rebuilding their colonies, but especially for hobbyist keepers, it can be a lot to maintain and it can be incredibly expensive. So we're trying to kind of make, make our bee population and our colonies and hives a little bit more sustainable. Now, here is the key factor about why is this happening? So in the beekeeping world and the bee world, we refer to it as the three Ps. So there's parasites, poor nutrition, and pesticides. Uh, now these threats sort of play off of each other to jeopardize the health of the colonies. For example, an excessive amount of pesticides can create, uh, affect the nutritional health of the bees, which makes it difficult for them to fight off infections. Just like human beings, if they're not healthy, they're gonna have trouble eating. <laughs> You're gonna have trouble thriving and existing and pollinating. So parasites actually, uh, this sort of stems from the fact that honeybees are not native to the United States and North America. Honeybees were actually brought over by European settlers to help pollinate and to help um, create honey for the colonies. So they actually are not equipped to deal with the insects and the various organic life that live in the United States. And this can be a big issue. Uh, there are a lot of different parasites that affect bees, but they are quite, quite nasty. They will actually infect 
um, an entire hive, an entire colony. And due to poor maintenance, they actually can be infected with mites, um, et cetera. So that's kind of a big issue right now, parasites or pests. Uh, pesticides. So pesticides, when used responsibly, can be wonderful and fantastic for agriculture and uh, food production. But unfortunately, we can't really gauge the effects that they have on honeybees and pollinators, because at this point, they're sort of working with, on average, three or four different chemical pesticides in hives. So it's really tough to gauge like what kind of these effects, what, what effects these all have, especially when building off of each other. Uh, now, finally, poor nutrition. And this is actually not just a big one, but also a pretty straightforward one to help fix. So poor nutrition is due to a lack of biodiversity and also human involvement. Um, basically, for agricultural development, essentially, farmers are planting a lot of one kind of crop, which is amazing for humans. You know, we, we love our avocados, we love our lemons, our limes, but bees, they like to... They, they tend to stay with one species, one species of pollination, but they also need a lot of different nutritional values. So just like a human being, if you only eat cheeseburgers all the time, you're not going to starve to death. You know, you'll still exist. You'll still be able to go about your day and live, but you're not going to be in those tip top shape. You know, you got to throw in some veggies in there. You got to balance your diet out. Bees have the exact same meat. So quick, fast fact here. And I also want to debunk a little bit about this. Um, 70 out of the top 100 human food crops, which supply about 90% of the world's nutrition, are pollinated by bees. Now, you'll often see that there are, um, you'll probably see this fact often, where it's one in every third bite of food was pollinated by a bee. This is very true. Uh, bees are this humongous widespread effect on human food production. However, it can sort of be a misleading fact. Um, for example, if bees did die out or if there was a mass extinction, not one of every third bite of food would go away. So we're not saying that these crops would go extinct if there was no more bees. However, there would be a very, very large scarcity of them. So you want to sort of think about like they will not be just totally wiped out like broccoli, asparagus, cantaloupes, cucumbers, they're not gonna be gone forever. However, there's gonna be a significantly, significantly lowered production. So that means that we would have incredibly high costs for these common crops. And obviously nobody wants to pay, I mean, almonds are already pretty expensive. I don't know, I live in New York City. <laughs> so we are already paying a lot for some of these choice crops and I don't wanna pay $30 for a bag of almonds. Bees help prevent that. So making sure that they're healthy and keeping their hives, keeping these colonies thriving prevents these prohibitively high food costs. So yes, well, one in third, one, one in every three bites of food is affected by bees. Don't think of it as this drastic, like, oh, well, we're gonna lose one third of our food population because that's not exactly the case. So just sort of take it, take it as a, not just face value there. What can we do to help? There are three things that I postulate for how we can help our bees. Preventing, monitoring, and supporting them. Fast. So there are over 4,000 native species of bees in North America. And honeybees are not one of them, as I mentioned. They were brought over by European settlers to help pollinate and produce honey. But yeah, 4,000 native species. So preventative measures is my big thing. And I wanted to especially touch on this because I think it's extremely accessible. So plant flowers, plant native flowers in your area, in your house. If you are in an urban location like I am, um, obviously I live in a little apartment in Brooklyn, so I don't have access to a big, beautiful garden. However, I do have a windowsill. I do work in schools that have out, outdoor space. So the goal is to kind of add more green spaces wherever you can and plant native flowers there. Um, currently in fall, we have our goldenrods, asters, and sunflowers blooming. Um, sunflowers are a particularly great way to help our bees because they have these big wide cups. 
So they're great for bees to land and hang out on. Uh, I would like to mention this activity of seed bombing. So I, I'm not sure you might be familiar with this concept, but essentially you use like a fertilizer and a bunch of goopy, so it depends on the product, an emulsifier perhaps, and then you add seeds to it and you're supposed to throw them in different places where you see dirt and grass. Um, however, this is not a particularly fruitful activity. No pun intended. Um, you can absolutely make seed bombs with kids, younger students. It's a really fun activity and it really can help them get engaged because I mean, we are all makers. You say bomb with something and I'm like, yeah, cool. What are we gonna, you know? So uh, it is a fantastic activity for practicing but you still have to plant them. You still have to uh, ensure that they're properly taken care of. Okay, so definitely look that up if it's something that you're interested in if you work in a classroom or if you just wanna make cool seed bombs, but ensure that they're actually getting planted properly. They do have to go in the ground. Um, you can't kind of like toss it off a highway and then hope it'll land. Um, but generally speaking, this goes back to the whole, we need more green spaces. We need more native flowers, uh, places for the bees to rest, places for them to pollinate and eat and snack. All right, fast fact. Scientists are currently in the process of breeding, breeding tougher bees. So this means bees that are a little bit stronger against pesticides, against pests, et cetera. They don't actually work out, but that would be kind of cool if they did. Okay, so here we're getting into our, our builds. Now, I would like to show you folks, um, there are a lot of really amazing companies now that have um, just incredible, incredible builds that help out our little bumbly friends. And now these are more techie builds. So if you are a maker, you might be familiar with your typical sensor kits, you know, infrared sensors, uh, humidity sensors, things like that, temperature. These are incredibly helpful when it comes to, um, you know, beehive maintenance. Now this again is for more of our beekeepers. So I'm just sort of introducing the topic. This isn't necessarily as accessible to someone who's just sort of like, okay, I wanna, I wanna help out our bees. We can make a little thing or plant a little thing. If you are interested in creating your own beehives, um, even if you are in an urban area, if you're in New York City, there is a huge movement now for urban beekeeping. So it is absolutely a possibility. Just keep that in mind. Um, I am going to quickly swap over to this IOB video. Bees are in crisis. Bee populations have been declining in Europe since the 90s, putting at risk our agriculture and way of life. The decline of bees concerns us all as they play an essential role in our agricultural systems and the environment. Bees help pollinate crops and maintain balanced ecosystems. In Europe, around 84% of plant species and 76% of food production depend on pollination. Researchers estimate that if we do not address the bee crisis and mortality continues to increase, the economic impact will be the loss of approximately 150 billion euros worldwide. We are facing a complex problem that requires new solutions. A European funded project has designed new sets of tools to improve monitoring and help address the challenges bees face. The Internet of Bees, or IOB, is a multidisciplinary project that has developed a three stage solution to increase our knowledge of bees and their relation with their environment. IOB introduces a variety of tools so that beekeepers, associations, researchers and policymakers can have a closer understanding of the environmental challenges that affect bees. IOB is a new approach that integrates different monitoring solutions. Its main objective is to disrupt the beehive monitoring market with a never-before-seen integration of different technologies. IOB is applying technological innovations linked to the Internet of Things to beekeeping and environmental monitoring. So imagine bees connected as if they, they were actually the internet 
of hives that will report to the beekeeper what is happening to them and the collective information of all the hives gives you a great picture of what is happening not only in an apiary but in a region where you have beekeepers that can be associated for instance and, and then you can uh, 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 you can upscale this this kind of, of, of uh, uh, net networking uh, to national and even to international levels where we hope that one day IOB could be a standard in Europe. IOB integrates three different levels of monitoring and data analysis for assessing bee health. It combines in-hive and field monitoring with satellite mapping, applying special decision support systems to bee-related data. IOB has produced and continuously improved cutting-edge monitoring systems for beehives. The Bee Counter is a monitoring system installed at the entrance of the hive that allows beekeepers to monitor their bees in real time. The Bee Counter tracks incoming and exiting traffic, providing valuable information for assessing the health of the colony. The beekeeper can then evaluate the strength of the foraging force, determine mortality rates in the field and identify deviations in flight duration and nectar availability. The bee counter sends collected data to a cloud server via cellular network. It is then automatically processed and visualised through a user-friendly way. Digital monitoring brings beekeepers closer to their bees. They can access the information at any time from their internet-connected devices and foresee which actions they should take next. IOB's bee counters provide up-to-date information on the status of the colony. IOB has continuously tailored its bee counters for the actual needs of beekeepers. Major representatives of the beekeeping sector have given direct feedback. IOB has collaborated with national associations throughout seven European countries to test the bee counter. IOB has also developed an e-gate, a sensor that identifies insects entering and exiting the colony by colour detection. The e-gate works with RGB colour code balance. It can determine if the hive is receiving unexpected guests, such as pests. IOB has also aimed to improve observations of conditions beyond the hive. An optoelectronic sensor automatically provides insect count and identifies different species. An in-field digital sensor measures the diversity and density of pollinators in the field. Monitoring pollinator availability is essential considering the importance of not only managed but also wild pollinators. The sensor is a new user and insect-friendly response to the challenges of traditional traps used to count pollinator density and diversity. It identifies flying insects without disturbing them. Therefore, there is no need to trap, kill, nor manually count insects. As insects fly through, the sensor automatically identifies their flight pattern and matches it with a species in the database. The sensor is also able to detect plates that affect bees, such as the Vespa velutina or Asian hornet. This invasive species has become a challenge for bees and beekeepers. It continues to spread around Europe, meriting further attention and new detection systems. The sensor allows for early detection, which improves the chance for effective responses from individuals, associations and authorities. Both in and off hive sensors work in synergy with the third stage of development in IOB. Monitoring parameters such as bee traffic and activity and the diversity and density of pollinators is jointly developed with satellite imaging and the application of special decision support systems. By applying a predictive model to data recovered by satellite imaging, it is now possible to provide a more extensive tool to understand the environmental condition of bees. This last stage of IOB makes it possible to determine the surrounding land use of a location. The beekeeper, association or other users can find out if a site is, for instance, surrounded by monocultures. Users can also discover the land cover types, whether this is, for example, grassland, forest, bare ground or others. Finally, this tool provides users with historical data on phenology, as well as a predictive model. They are now able to determine the availability of resources, such as pollen or nectar, which directly influences the overall well-being of bees. IOB introduces an integrative logic that goes from the hive to the surrounding environment. The parallel development and integration of monitoring tools is a crucial element for IOB. These new tools have only been possible to achieve with close collaboration with beekeepers around Europe. 
IOB is an interdisciplinary project with partners from different countries of the European Union. It includes private firms, academia and non-governmental organisations. The parallel application of several tools is now opening the possibility to create a new integrative platform for pollinator-related data. IOB is now leading the way for the integration and visualisation of different sources of data. Gathering, processing and communicating data will be an essential part of the future of bee and pollinator protection. We need bees for the future, and innovation is becoming essential to ensure their protection. IOB is integrating different solutions to make a better future for bees, the environment and ourselves a reality. So that is just one of a few different um, IoT companies. There's makers. I'm actually going to share with you uh, the resources. There's a Make Zine article about this as well. So there's tons of cool IoT B stuff. Uh, give me one moment to get back to our presentation. I also had a question about uh, whether or not it was possible to create a community or neighborhood hive. And that is a fantastic question. And it absolutely is. Um, I, totally, I totally recommend this, actually, because uh, in order to create hives, you need to make sure that you are maintaining them. And so the more cooks in the kitchen on this instance, you're actually helping out not just yourself, but your bees. So I definitely recommend doing a community hive. Uh, if you are in the New York City area, I can speak officially that there are different New York restoration projects that you can actually um, get in contact with. Brooklyn, oh, wonderful, cool. So we get We'll have to chat. Um, but yeah, so Brooklyn, there's new, the New York Restoration Project. There's also the Community Gardens. Um, there's also tons of beekeepers around, urban beekeepers, um, a lot of them actually based in Brooklyn. And they have their rooftop apiaries as well as backyards. Um, the Queens Museum actually has an entire farm set up. And so it's absolutely possible to do community gardens. Um, I would even say that if you work with a school or a community organization, that's also an excellent place to start and jump in. Um, it really isn't super expensive. It's just you need to put in the time for it. So again, more people that can jump in and just go check on them, make sure that the hives are clean, uh, free of pests, etc. And absolutely, you're, you're definitely able to. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna jump back to this. So, so yeah, there's our monitoring with IoT. And you know, you, you can do those, um, this, there's the scales for the hives, et cetera. But even if you're just an at-home hobbyist, um, I would recommend using just say uh, an Arduino with the humidity temperature sensor. So you can just kind of keep an eye on your bees, make sure that their housing is, is secure, insulated and a, a nice happy environment for them. And again, that's just throwing together a couple of cheap sensors. So definitely very possible at home. Um, the next thing that I wanna touch on, and this is a great, great way to help our bees out, um, are bee houses. So this is a little different than a hive. So when you are creating a bee hive, this is a community of bees and you need to consistently maintain them. Um, they will stay with you throughout the winter and come back the next year, hopefully with good numbers, but bee houses are almost like little community spots for bees. So these can be done, first of all, very cheap, very easily, and you can sort of plop them all over your neighborhood or your community and give bees a spot to rest or to hang out. And that is incredibly helpful for the health of the bee. Uh, Cause again, just like human beings, you know, we don't go, we don't constantly keep going all day, all day, all day. Uh, we need to sit down for a little bit. We need to sleep at night. We need to even just entertain ourselves for a bit. So bees have the same need. Um, and a fun fact is bees will actually sleep. They will take little naps in flowers when they are out and they are pollinating. If they see a flower with a decent enough little cup petal, they will just plop right down and take a nap together. So that is a very adorable and cool fact. So bee houses can be made of any recyclable materials. Generally speaking, if it's made of wood, even um, plywood, cheap materials, that is okay. Those are safe for bees. Uh, bees are smart. They will nest where they want to nest. They will, they will hang out where they want to hang out. Um, the one thing that I would uh, issue a warning about is just to ensure that there's no mold growing, um, make sure that there is a decent overhang so that it protects them from the majority of the elements. But yeah, wood is a fantastic, fantastic choice for building a little bee house. 
Uh, pallets and logs are also a great way to make just a nice little enclosure for bees. Uh, if you take a look here at my example, you'll see that these logs have basically just been drilled out. Um, the pallets have spots for them to sit in. This is more like of a hive build, but hypothetically, you can just grab a log cutting and drill some holes in it, and that's a nice bee resting spot. They are very much drawn to wood, and wood is natural. They, they vibe with wood, if you will. And finally, we get to 3D printing. So 3D printing, as we, as makers know, is just, to me, I still think of it as this magical thing. Um, you know, you create something from your imagination and then it's in the world just like that. And we can use this magical in, in innovation to help our bee friends out. Um, PLA, as you know, is biodegradable, so it's safe if you're gonna just plop them all around the neighborhood like I, I would love to see. Um, so it's, it's great for the environment. The bees will hang out in there. Um, and also the, the beauty of PLA as opposed to wood or the bamboo housing is that PLA is super, super easy to clean. I mean, it's just, if you see there's no bees hanging out in there, you can just take your, your house down, give it a quick wipe, make sure there's nothing living in there that's not supposed to be living there and then you're good to go. So PLA is not just, effective because it's easy, it's easily maintained. Um, I wanted to give a shout out specifically to this gentleman, Frank Falco, who created this uh, bee resting spot. So this sort of riffs off of the bee houses that I was just displaying, but this is a, a planter as well as a bee resting spot. So if you have a, a garden or if you notice community gardens, it would be fantastic for you to place little, thingies like this. So basically just a spot where bees can go burrow in and sit. So bees are not gonna make hives here. They're not gonna start their communities here. But again, just like people, they need a spot to go chill out. And this is a wonderful chill out spot. Obviously the flowers are a great um, attraction to the bees. And then they have a spot to go after they pollinate. And this, the link to that build will actually be in the resources as well. So this is a super, super simple Tinkercad uh, bee house, a bee resting house that I created. And I will actually walk you all through how to do that. So I chose Tinkercad for this because as an educator, um, it is just such a quick, simple way to introduce young folk to 3D design and CAD. And it's free, you know, open source always. So I'm gonna actually tap out of here very quickly. if it will let me. You know, it's been so funny teaching virtually because I feel like I am now the teacher who could not get the VCR to work when I was a kid. <laughs> and it's definitely been an interesting juxtaposition for sure. So you're like, well, wait. And then I have kids like, oh, Ms. Amanda, you didn't share the sound. And it's just like, you know, I'm revisiting my, my days as a kid where it was like, oh, you have, to, you have to hit auxiliary. This is where we are. Life is cyclical. Okay. So this is the uh, little mini bee house that I have made. This is basically just two shapes that I melded together. Super, super simple. And it should print incredibly easy. I should move this little guy over. But um, all I did was take our polygon here, get it to a nice size. I do wanna say when you are creating um, more of these hive type houses, or even just our regular bee houses. Uh, if you're if you're planning, or if there's like a large bee population in the area, I would suggest keeping the holes about six inches deep. That is that is a great size for the bees. That gives them enough time, uh, enough room to wiggle around, fly around, and do their thing. Um, so what I'm doing here is I am on Tinkercad. I have grabbed a polygon. I have stretched it upwards. And then I'm going to make a copy of it. I usually use keyboard commands, but you can also use this nifty tool right up here, which is the duplicate and repeat. Then I'm gonna drag that over and I'm going to turn it into a hole, which is right over here on the top right. Uh, now I'm going to reduce the size just a teensy teensy bit. Say 16 by 16, perfect. And I am going to stretch it upwards a little bit just because then I can kind of work with it a little bit easier when I'm bringing it into my tube here. So now that that is 
relatively even here. I'm going to lift it up using the curved arrow at the top. And what, I'm, what that does here is because I don't want a straight tube. I would like to have a flush bottom here. So these aren't, these aren't going to be actual tubes. It's a tube with a flat non-exit. Okay, so now that I have this about in the spot I want, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click and drag over so that both shapes are selected, which I can tell in the top right over here because it'll say two shapes. And then I'm going to group them, which is this button that looks like a square and a circle block together. And now you can see I have this neat little tube. So this is a perfect little bee hanging out spot. Uh, then I'm going to just literally same thing, duplicate and move them around into, oop, not like that. <laughs> move them around into the pattern of my choosing. Now again, so this, this part when you're creating these bee resting and hanging out areas, they don't have to be particularly shaped you know, bees will just go in there and, and, and rest. They're, they're discerning in the sense that, you know, if it's, if I fits, I sits, I think was the old Mimi phrase. Um, but you should ensure that there is some sort of roof, some kind of way to shelter the bees from any elements, okay? So that is essentially basically all you do. You don't need to make it in the same honeycomb pattern. I just did that because I thought it looked neat. But you know, it's just this nice little spot. And this will print very well too, because you can just print it uh, standing upwards and it'll just build right off of each other. I also would recommend printing printing the roof separately. That way you can uh, like, you can attach it however you'd like to, but then you could also stop, take the whole thing apart and clean it. That is that very brief one. Now, there are a couple things about creating these bee houses and these nests. Um, you'll often see online, people will create these, actually, this is a really excellent example of it. So these, the circular or whatever shaped bee houses with the bamboo sticks, and those are great as their own objects. However, you'll often see that they have strings attached to them. Um, so you should never actually, add your bee houses or your resting spots with just string. It is incredibly dangerous to the bees. Um, bees are kind of clumsy flyers, especially if they've just pollinated and they're all like sugary drunk. Um, they will have a lot of trouble getting into their resting spots or into their hives. So you want to make sure that it is not just this flimsy string that kind of blows with the wind. It needs to be very um, steady and secure for the bee. So the bee can just land nice and clumsily and not worry about having to angle for, you know, a, a, a spot that is moving around, okay? So that is one pretty important caveat to that whole spiel. So make sure that they're six inches deep, the holes, and make sure that the whatever creation you make, bee house, resting spot, make sure that it is quite secure. Because uh, again, it is a danger to our clumsy little bumblebees. That might be why they're called bumblebees, because they bumble around. All right. All right, so I'm gonna jump back over here. And that, that, that file is available online. So if you just want a quick design and see how it's done, that is right there. And finally, here are just a couple things before I wrap up. So bees are amazing. They're, they're doing a little bit rough right now, but we can definitely help them out. Um, on super cheap and super easy budget, plant native flowers, create little bee resting spots, and you know educate your community, educate your neighbors, your, your family, your schools. Um, it's, these are very, very simple tips. If we just could add plants to every little spot that we could, bees would have such a fighting shot. If we had little resting areas, bees would have a wonderful way of getting back to their hives. And quite frankly, we would benefit from it as humans because flowers are beautiful and we all like to have sustainable food that isn't a million dollars because there's no more avocados. So yeah, that is my presentation for everybody today. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my website is amandagretza.com. I'll actually share with you there we go. So 
Sydney Hive House. Uh, I'll share with you the resources. So beinformed.org was a humongous help for putting all this together and just generally a fantastic nonprofit. Uh, we also have IOB, which is from that video that I, I showed you that has more of the, the high tech and uh, the actual hive solutions. Um, Native New York Gardens is fantastic for all of you New Yorkers joining me that would like to plant more flowers, of course. And then amanagretza.com. My blog is actually going to have a list of all of these resources, as well as the link to the STL file uh, that I just showed you, and actually just the straight Tinkercad uh, model. So you can just download it right from there if you feel like practicing and printing out some cool little bee houses. Uh, so that is it. And if you have any questions, please feel free to head to my website and ask me anything. I am all about bee stuff. So I would love to help you get a community hire started or just answer any questions that you might have. And I hope you all have a lovely maker fair. <laughs>